Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this week I actually find a use for some wood that I had laying around and make my biggest ever sculpted table, and actually my biggest ever round table. Stay tuned. People often ask me, what do you do with all of that leftover wood? Do you burn it? Can I have it? And the answer sometimes is yes to both, but generally I try to keep it and repurpose it later. And both of these pieces came off the same slab that I made, oh, just probably a couple months ago, and they were really pretty wood, and you can see it's actually a really thick stock, so I thought I could actually do something with it. So I took this long, a little bit narrower piece, and I'm gonna cut it into two medium-sized chunks, glue them together, and this is gonna be kind of the main stem of a round table base that I'm making. I think walnut varies in color more than any other wood, whereas if you got a white oak slab, you could pretty much match it with another white oak slab relatively closely, whereas something like this walnut varies in color from like a light brown to a dark brown to this really kind of almost deep red with some almost black streaks in it once it gets finished. And because of this, it's really important when you're building a project to build it all from the same tree, if at all possible, because I don't like staining things and stain always just kind of to mute the colors. So if I'm just gonna highlight the natural colors, they all need to be from the same tree. And especially for the shaft section, both of these definitely needed to match. And even the base that I used is from the same slab. So everything is gonna match just perfectly. There are two main camps in the woodworking world when it comes to doing glue ups. One side says you only add glue to one piece and then add the other piece dry. The other side is like I'm doing there and adding glue to both pieces. And I don't feel super passionate about it. Part of me feels like one piece might almost get like an air pocket or a dry spot. I don't know if I'm being that sensitive. I would love to know the counter argument to why not add glue to both sides. So if you do feel strongly about it, let me know your opinions on adding glue to one or both. Most of the projects you've seen me build over the last few years have been commissioned by clients. And I have been very fortunate to have so many amazing clients that allow me to do what I love every day. The only problem with clients is they only order what they've already seen you make. They might see a past project of mine and go, that's really cool, I want one just like it for my house. And I had never expected YouTube to actually be like a source of income where YouTube is now my main job, but here we are. And when it comes to building the same thing over and over again, those can get a little bit repetitive for viewing. So for this one, we're doing something a little bit different. And I've never done a project quite like this, at least on this scale. I think it's gonna be really cool. And this isn't for a client. We're actually gonna be auctioning this one off, like probably on eBay, if you check the description, I'll have a link for it. But 100% of the proceeds are gonna be going to Make-A-Wish. And when I say 100%, I don't mean I'm recouping any costs. I mean, I'm providing the table, I'm providing the shipping to the lower 48, and providing a crate. I am taking zero money off the top. 100% of the proceeds are going to the local Make-A-Wish. So. I'm really excited to build something new, get a video that it's a little bit different, and hopefully raise some money for a good cause. I really like having a 12 inch miter saw, but I feel like no matter how big of a tool we get, we always max it out. We always need one just a little bit bigger. And that's what the problem was here is that 12 inch miter saw couldn't quite cut through this stock. So I had to come back with my router table and my flush trim bit and just nip off that last little bit. The design that I'm going for is based on a couple of end tables that I built in a video a couple months ago. And for that video, I wanted to spend less than $100 and then make $1,000 profit, not using any of my social media. And for that, I hand sculpted a couple of end tables. And I think in the end, I was able to make about $950. And it was a really cool video. And I even just got a comment from someone saying that they liked the idea and they were inspired by it. So they copied the design, made their own Etsy listing, and they were able to make a similar sale. And I think they said it was eight days. So really proud of that because I think woodworking should be more accessible than some of these, you know, super expensive slabs that you see me use in other videos. So if you want to see that video, I'll leave a link in the video description as well. For the sculpted tables I've built in the past, I have attached the stem to the base with epoxy and just a domino. And that is really, really strong, but this is gonna be kind of a full-size dining table or at least a full-size breakfast table. So I wanted something even stronger than that. So I'm doing kind of an oversized mortise and tenon joint. And to do that, I needed to make a little jig. And that's all I'm doing here was just cutting. It's not even a perfect square. It's just barely off of being a square. So just a perfectly 90 degree kind of rectangle that I'm attaching with double side tape. And I'm gonna be using my router with a brass bushing jig 
to cut the notch here. And this will all make sense in just a little bit, but using this jig enables me to make perfect 90s and I could go about as deep as the router bit would go, which was around two inches or so. After I got the mortise cut, I could take the same jig over to my stem and cut the same recess there, just making sure that I have the grain lined up the way I want it to go, because I do want those vertical stripes to go the same direction on both the base and the stem. So really critical that I didn't forget that there. But the cool thing about this is it will be a perfect fit. I just need to cut a tenon now that matches it just exactly. And since, I, as I mentioned before, it's not a perfect square, I have to make a couple cuts and just really slowly dial this in. And this walnut here isn't from the same tree. It actually doesn't matter. I probably that it's even walnut at all. But you see, I got the first one cut and then that one was still a little bit too big. And this was quite a few more tries than that. I probably spent about a half an hour there taking a little bit out at a time. After I got both sides fitting just barely snug, I took it over to my router table. And since I cut the uh, mortise with a half inch router bit, I used my quarter inch round over there to round over each corner. And in theory, all of these are gonna just slide right in because if I used a half inch router bit, should work with a quarter inch round over bit, in theory. And as you can see, I actually got pretty lucky and that ended up working in the end, but it was quite snug and I had a little bit of a problem not getting it in, but the problem was getting it out. And this made me feel a little bit better about using this as far as strength goes, but it was actually a little bit frustrating working this out. The glue that I'm gonna be using for this is like a marine epoxy. It's different than the deep pour epoxy you see me use in some of my tables. And the reason I'm going with epoxy is it does a better job at holding this long grain to the end grain. And normally I really like just plain old wood glue, but for this bond, I think epoxy is gonna be a little bit better. In one of my past videos, I was doing essentially the same thing. I was having to come up with a way to clamp this stem to the base and I did it by stretching a two by four over the top and running clamps to either side. And I thought that I was pretty clever and someone commented, they're like, yeah, there's a name for that. That's called bridge clamping. And I didn't know there was an actual name for it, but it does work well for something like this. One of the most difficult and frustrating parts of doing these carved bases is even though this base was planed flat before I got started, by the end, there's almost always some little warping and twisting and it doesn't sit perfectly flat. And it's really frustrating and I finally came up with a solution for it. And that's what this little notch is here. And you'll have to wait to see how I actually use this notch, but this is gonna enable me to keep the base perfectly flat. Normally, this is about the time when I would do my best to find a way to ask you for a subscription without annoying you, but this time we're gonna do things a little bit different. I've never asked you guys to share a video before, but this time I think it's a little bit different. As I mentioned earlier, 100% of the proceeds of this one are gonna be going to Make-A-Wish, so I think this is a really good cause. And if we can get enough people to share this, I think we could potentially raise a good amount of money. All we really need is two people that really like this. As anybody who's done an auction knows, it only takes two. So if we can get this in front of as many people as we can, I think it could really help drive the bidding up. And even if the auction is already over by the time you watch this, maybe you're watching it a year later, the better these types of videos do, the more of them I'll be able to do. So I would still love it if you could share it. Save the subscription, subscribe on the next video if you like it. But this one, if you're willing to share Facebook, a link, an email, however you can, I would love it if you could help get the word out about this fundraiser. If you're a woodworker looking to kind of separate yourself from what's already out there, I highly recommend trying some of this power carving. There's not a lot of people out there. My first several projects weren't very good and I finally am actually rather proud of the last several projects I've been able to make. And if you want some advice, start at the base there. That transition at the very bottom in the middle is where I start all my tables now. Because if you try to start from the outside in, by the time you get to that center section, you might not like that transition. Whereas if you start from the in and work outwards, you can really kind of control how the flow looks. And for this, I'm using primarily these Cutsaw discs. And this is the Cutsaw Extreme disc here. They have been a longtime supporter of my channel. And this is the blue extreme disc and they're made from tungsten carbide. They don't ever really get dull. They do a really great job of smoothing it out. They do make a lot of dust. So you need your eye protection. You need a respirator for sure. I like to wear gloves. Gloves and woodworking are kind of a controversial issue because people think that they can get caught in the machine, but really I don't think an angle grinder is powerful enough to suck your glove in and hurt your hand. And 
Here I'm actually trying a flap disc. This is like a metal working disc and some people in my last video told me I should try it. And it actually did work really well, but this flap disc just for one was like $10 and they do wear out, I don't know, relatively quickly. Whereas those cuts all discs are about 60 bucks and they essentially last really forever, more or less. Most of the time I can get all of the rough power carving done in just one day or even just one afternoon. This table was actually a little bit too big so it stretched into the second day and that's what I'm doing here is getting it set up on day two. And if you're wondering what that vise is that I'm using there, that's called a jaw horse. And that was actually a suggestion from someone in the comments of one of my last video. I was doing the carving on that log and it was flopping all around and they just said, hey, why don't you get a jaw horse? And I'd heard of them, but I was kind of skeptical of the three leg design, but it actually works really well. And I was able to do basically all the power carving with that jaw horse. And if you're wondering what tool that is there, that is the Arbotech turbo plane. And it doesn't leave a particularly smooth finish, but it does a really good job at removing a lot of material in a hurry, as you can see there. So I did the very rough carving with the turbo plane, and then I switched back over to the cut saw for the finer smoothing out. And you don't need this many cut saw wheels. I really like the original cut saw fine disc. This is one of their more concave ones in a medium grit, but start with just one. They're like 60 bucks. Most woodworkers probably have an angle grinder, so you can really, really get started power carving with just one $60 cut saw disc. And from there, you can kind of add discs as needed. After I got all the loose debris blown in the general direction of my neighbor's house, I was ready to go back inside and start smoothing out some of those lumps. And for this stage, I really like using a spoke shave. And if you've never used a spoke shave, you really don't need to be intimidated. There's no real way to mess it up. If you have it set too deep, it'll just catch on the wood and won't really shave anything off. So just play around with the setting until it starts removing little shavings. And it's actually a pretty fun tool to use. And it does a really good job at smoothing out all those high spots. If you're wondering, that chunk behind me is a giant piece of old growth redwood for an upcoming project that costs like $4,500 from GL Veneer. And I'm actually really curious what this piece actually sells for because price is always a very contentious issue with anything that I make. Some people can't fathom spending ten dollars to $20,000 on a table that costs me two dollars to $5,000 to make. And I've always wondered what those people think of a $20 million painting that costs the artist like $80 to make though. And I guess at least those paintings have a chance to appreciate more than my tables anyway. In fact, according to Art Price, appreciation on blue chip art has even blown away the S&P 500 over the last two decades or so, and this video's sponsor Masterworks has found a way to capitalize on this appreciation. Masterworks actually buys the fine art and sells shares in it to the public in a legit Securities and Exchange Commission sanctioned platform. Then when the time is right, they sell the painting and each shareholder is paid out accordingly. And there is a lot more to it than this, and you shouldn't listen to woodworking YouTubers for investment advice. So go check out masterworks.io and see if it's right for you. At this stage, I'm actually still shaping pretty heavily. I'm using 40 grit sandpaper on my Rotex sander. And if you've never used a Rotex, it's kind of like a hybrid between an angle grinder and a sander. With the 40 grit, it can move a lot of material really quick, so I can still continue to shape it. And here I'm ready to start doing the little recess on the underside and this is going to make it easier for the table to sit flat and it's the same reason why you see bowls and plates with a little ring around them because it's much easier for that small ring to sit flat than the entire surface having to be perfectly flat and this time I'm doing it a little different. I caught a little flack. People said that it was kind of ugly that I did underneath. So I like this textured pattern and this is an ArborTech ball gouge and so I'm going to just carve out this textured pattern on the entire underside. And this way it'll look pretty cool. I get to practice my texturing and it will provide that recess that'll allow that outer ring to sit perfectly flat. I mentioned earlier that this piece started out flat, but I knew from past experience by the time I got done doing all the work on it, that there was gonna be some variation, some little warp or twist or cup. And that center section in theory was gonna enable me to correct this. And here's what I came up with. I had that little center section recessed put that block of plywood in there and I ran a screw into that piece of MDF. So as I rotate it on that screw, it will slowly take off the low spots. And I'd never done this before. I've never seen this done before and I wasn't entirely sure it was gonna work. I've had problems in the past when I've tried to get a little too clever, but I went really slow. I had really sharp bit and I slowly rotated it around. And as I went, I realized it was actually working and I was thrilled because this was gonna make it so it was gonna be perfectly flat, which is always such a challenge. 
The only problem was after I got done and got the entire ring the same height, that center section now was actually sticking out, whereas it used to be recessed. Since I'd already textured that center section, it was gonna be really hard to track the progress of where I needed to still remove material. And to make that a little bit easier, I did an automotive trick, and that was actually to use spray paint so I could track my progress. And you probably noticed earlier with that ArborTech, it caused a lot of chip out that I had to clean up. And this is the Cutsall Ball Nose Burr, and this doesn't chip out at all. The only problem is my die grinder isn't nearly as powerful as an angle grinder, so it took a little bit longer. So the cut salt is much smoother, much nicer, no chip out, but the ArborTech is nice because you're able to attach it to an angle grinder. Eventually, I'll just get a more powerful die grinder and that should solve that problem. And there, I still had a few high points, so I used the cut salt fine disc, smoothed them out, made sure everything was flat with my level, and now I was ready to move on. One of my all-time favorite magazine ads reads, if your Harvey Prober chair wobbles, straighten your floor. And while I don't know that mine is good as a Harvey Prober, it's still pretty freaking good. I was actually pretty surprised by how few imperfections and little defects that I had to clean up in this piece, but there's always some, and there is one small natural crack there that I'm filling with CA glue and activator, and it's ready to sand in just a few seconds. There was also one small crack right in the middle of the shaft that I was able to use more of that CA glue and activator. And again, you can sand it in like 10 seconds and I'll show you just how invisible that CA glue makes it. Just takes a few passes with that and you can see it start to go away and then it's basically disappeared. So all in all, a pretty clean piece. Unlike a lot of YouTubers, I generally think it's a better practice to under promise and over deliver when it comes to saying how amazing a project was or how pretty something turned out. And at the risk of that, and as pretty as this wood is here, it really doesn't compare to the wood on the top that I have coming up. It's a really special piece. I've actually had it for a few years. I've been waiting for it just the right project. That said, I love this base. I love those black streaks, how they kind of continue all the way up the shaft there. It's a really remarkable piece. This textured underside, I don't know that I would go through the trouble of doing it again. It was kind of a lot of work, but in the end, it was kind of cool and something a little bit different. And if you're wondering, the finish I'm using is called Rubio Monaco. You basically just wipe it on, wipe it off. It does provide excellent protection and you can still feel all the wood grain. It's not like any plasticky layer there. And people are always asking me, do you sign your work? Will you sign your work? And it always seemed kind of pretentious. I thought, why would anybody want my signature? But for this one, I signed and dated it, figured why not? And then add a little finish on top. I'm sure some of the haters out there will say that this top is a little too small to actually serve breakfast or dinner on, but I think that it brings everybody closer together. I love the design. Let me know in the comments what you think of this top. Okay, that was a joke. Let me show you the real top. All right, that little practical joke probably cost me some viewers, so anybody still watching, I'll take you to see the real top for this. and. This one goes back quite a ways. You have to go all the way back to like my 12th Instagram post to see this slab. And this is a really, really pretty slab, but I actually bought it on Craigslist. It was cut down in the 60s and the guy had it in his barn with a bunch of other wood from the tree. And I wanted to practice my bow ties. So I did and they were okay, but I learned pretty quick that they weren't really the standard of what I was trying to do. So I kind of just leaned it up in a room for quite a while. And I never really knew what to do with it until now. So now I finally get to turn this top into the top for this round table. And you see, it does have a couple issues there. I have some threaded inserts that I put in before and that chainsaw mark. So I'm gonna have to be able to fix both of those. The method that I'm gonna use to fix that chainsaw mark is really similar to the mortise and tenon that you saw me do earlier. This is just a random piece of plywood that I have that I have a number of pre-cut rectangles for this type of work. And I found one that just fit over that chainsaw mark, used my brass bushing and a half inch router bit. You'd see I didn't get down quite far enough. So I just kept going till I had the entire chainsaw mark removed on the inside of that circle. Then I needed some wood that matched it. So I cut a little piece off there, took it over to my table saw, lined it up, made a kind of a sketchy, dangerous cut that you're not supposed to make. Got it just the size I needed. Also wasn't gonna need it that thick. So I took it over to the bandsaw, ripped it down to a more manageable size. And instead of doing the roundover trick that I did before, I'm actually gonna chisel these out with my corner chisel here. 
for just a nice sharp square edge. The reason I'm using wood glue here instead of epoxy is first off, we're going long grain to long grain instead of end grain to long grain. And the wood glue tends to look a little better. The epoxy tends to leave a little bit of a dark line, which you actually can see on that table base. So when you don't have to use it, I don't recommend using epoxy for these wood to wood joints. If you've seen my videos before, you know that I am not afraid to show a mistake. So when I do an inlay like this, a patch job, they don't always turn out how you're expecting. And sometimes you get it sanded down, you go, wow, that looks really bad. So there's always a little bit of a question mark of what it's actually gonna look like. And this one here, I'm actually quite pleased with, even for the top of a table, but this is actually gonna be on the underside of a table. So I feel very confident that nobody will ever notice that one. There are a lot of ways to cut a circle. There's tons of DIY jigs you can get. This one is just one that I bought. And one thing you'll notice, the Festool is so good at the dust collection, when it's not hooked up, it actually piles all the dust there right on top, whereas a normal router just throws it everywhere. So it's actually kind of frustrating when you're trying to freehand route with a Festool because you can't actually see what you're routing because it piles all the dust right on top of it. But it is nice that when the dust collection is hooked up, it does remove most all of it. And here's how I have to cut the rest of the circle is I didn't want to cut all the way through with that router bit because it could blow out and splinter on the other side. So I used my jigsaw, cut kind of close to the line, and then got that flush trim bit again. And now I'm just gonna go through and clean up all of that remaining wood, riding against that first router cut line. Once I get this cleaned up into a perfect circle, or at least a perfect circle, minus just that little kiss of a live edge that I decided to leave in there, I'm gonna be using a one inch roundover on the bottom and a quarter inch roundover on top. And this is something I've been doing on a lot of my round tables. I think it's a little more interesting to have different roundovers on the bottom versus the top than having the same radius on the bottom and the top. Just had to do a little bit of manual cleanup there. And then as I start this finish process, as I'm getting closer, there's always more imperfections that need filled. So more CA glue, more activator, and just wanted this to be as absolutely nice as I could get it. And it's really not a ton more work to spend a couple more minutes filling these imperfections. After I got all these imperfections filled, I had just a little bit of sanding, and by that I mean around five or six hours, which I'll spare you having to watch all that, and we can get right to the fun part, which is the finishing. And if you're wondering what those slots are, I actually added some low-profile C channels to this table, which don't actually make it stronger or anything like that. All they do is keep it from warping or cupping, just that little bit of just kind of twisting that these big wide slabs like to do. The C channels are gonna kind of snug everything up and make sure it stays perfectly flat for a very, very long time. You could see it some on the underside, but when I add the finish to the top here is when you really get to see the figure in this wood come alive. And if you're wondering what those little 3D ripples are, that's wood figuring. This particular type of figuring is called curl and it's an amazing effect. It looks beautiful. It's actually totally flat. It looks like ridges, but everything is perfectly flat. And wood like this is normally reserved for like really high-end guitars. You'll see it a lot with like the, you know, $10,000 guitars. I actually got teased by some guitar guys on my Instagram page for using wood like this on a big table because they can make, I don't know, so many guitars out of a table like this and probably make a lot more money than a regular table maker. I had the wood and there was no way I was gonna cut this up into little chunks. And that is what that figuring is called. And so I love it. Somebody on Facebook or something was saying that it looked cracked, but I assure you it's a highly desirable trait in these wood slabs. For attaching the top to the base, I'm gonna be using something that's very heavy duty and also very low profile so you don't notice it. And since I'm not a metal worker, I bought that disc of quarter inch steel off of eBay and then took it over to my drill press and tried to pretend that I was a metal worker for just a couple minutes. And all I did was drill a number of holes, use my countersink so I could flush mount some bolts in there. I think I added five to attach this plate to the stem of the table base. And then I have two, four, five, six that are gonna attach to the main tabletop. And I'll show you how that attaches here in just a second. No matter how much you over-engineer something, if you put the build on YouTube, people will say that it is dangerously under-engineered and it is gonna snap like a twig. People will probably say these threaded inserts are gonna pop out, and I assure you each one of these has holding power into the hundreds if not thousands of pounds. 
They will also probably comment on the stem of this table base saying it's gonna snap instantly. And it's probably three times the diameter of a baseball bat and it's laminated with two pieces. And I don't know if you've ever tried to break laminated wood or a baseball bat, but it's not that easy. So I assure you, nothing is gonna break, nothing is gonna snap. It is plenty engineered. All right, let's get down to brass tacks. If you wanna buy this table, if you wanna bid on this table, there's a link in the video description. Again, 100% of the proceeds go to Make-A-Wish. It's a great cause. The table measures 30 inches tall by about 43 inches in diameter. I'll show you here with a few chairs set around it just so you can see it does fit four people comfortably. I will even sit at it and you can see just how much leg room I have. No problem, the dog even likes it. We were dog sitting and my mom's dog came up to say hi. Oh, and here is that chainsaw mark. If you can't see it, I'm not gonna point it out. Oh, and this week, start your question or comment with the dollar amount you think this table is gonna go for, and that way I will know you made it all the way to the end of the video. Thanks so much.